White Cane Day Panel 2021 A screenshot of the panel and participants on Zoom Presented by the Kansas State School for the Blind A logo with a flying blue eagle at the center of a sunflower Welcome to our White Cane Day Awareness Panel with Kansas State School for the Blind. It's fun to see people from all across the state. I see several classrooms from KSSB. I see a friend from Mays. I see friends from Garden City. I'm looking to see, we have 29 devices joining our meeting at this moment. And I know there are multiple people on many of those devices. So I think we had about 90 people registered to join us today so that we can celebrate October 1st and the beginning of White Cane Awareness Month. Blindness Awareness Month, there are lots of terms that are used. And of course, October 15th is the official date that somebody picked. I guess I don't even know for sure who picked the date of October 15th specifically, but we wanted to get together at the beginning of the month so that we can spend the whole month joining together. So you may be wearing your White Cane Day t-shirts that you um, received in previous years or that you were able to get a new one this year. So I encourage you to keep wearing that all month. Um, and we're just gonna spend some time today chatting with some maybe new friends and maybe some that you're familiar with. If you don't know me, my name is Anna Sear. I'm a field services specialist with the Kansas State School for the Blind. I live in Bueller, Kansas, which is in the central part of the state and serve students here in central and north central Kansas. Um, and we have several friends with us today who are going to talk with us. So we have three guests with us this morning who are adults, who have some involvement in being per persons who use white canes or certainly in being persons who live the life as a person who's visually impaired, who have agreed to join us this morning and just share a little bit about life. So many of you sent in questions that you had for these participants. And so we're just going to have a conversation among us. If you listen to podcasts at all, and maybe you even listen to the KSSB podcast, you've probably heard some discussions kind of like this. And that's kind of how I hope to tailor this discussion this morning is just five friends sitting around a microphone through Zoom. Um, talking about life as a person with a visual impairment and how we navigate that and what we do. So I'd like to introduce our guests to you this morning. Our first guest is Kelly Miller. Kelly's the independent owner and operator of Massage by Kelly in Hutchinson, Kansas. She's the current chair of the board of directors of Prairie Independent Living Resource Center, which we more likely like to call Pillar around here because that's a little shorter. And she's the creator of Blind Craft Crochet, a side business that keeps her hands busy while she eagerly awaits the call that her first dog guide placement is ready for training. In her spare time, Kelly enjoys spending time outdoors and attending live music events. Kelly, would you like to say hi to everybody this morning? Hi, I'm really excited to be here. I think this is gonna be a lot of fun. Awesome, thanks for coming, Kelly. Our next panelist is Christian Pewitt. Christian is a teacher of students with visual impairments and community, ex community support and accessibility specialist at the Kansas State School for the Blind. I'm learning we like really long titles at the school. We need to kind of shrink those up maybe, I don't know. He's also the coach of KSSB's speech and debate program. When he's not working, Christian's very involved with the Kansas City, Kansas Chamber of Commerce's Young Professionals Organization. Christian loves water sports, especially at Table Rock Lake in Missouri and the Gulf Coast beaches in Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama. And he's a fan of gut finding good food. And of course, that would include local Kansas City barbecue. So Christian, would you like to say good morning today? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for being here, Christian. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. And finally, Sheila Styron works as a blindness and low vision specialist for the whole person, a center for independent living in Kansas City, Missouri. Sheila was the first person who was blind to have become certified as an ADA coordinator and trainer. Sheila is a strong advocate for eliminating barriers, barriers for people living with disabilities. She promotes public transportation and worked with the Department of Justice on its re revised division. Wow, revised definition, let's try that, of service animals. 
Formerly a professional musician, Sheila enjoys playing the ukulele, practicing yoga and cross country skiing, as well as pursuing adventures like swimming with dolphins and skydiving. So good morning, Sheila. Hi, everybody. I am here with my white cane hanging on the back of my office door and my guide dog at my feet. All right. You are well prepared. You've got all the tools. Today. I can love it. go either way. <laughs> good. Okay, well, that just kind of launches us into what we want to talk about. We have this conversation, and I'm motivated to have this conversation for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's White Cane Awareness Month, and we celebrate White Cane Awareness Day on October 15th, and it's a great way to talk about that, to advocate, to interact with one another, and of course, inform the community about white canes and why they exist and why we use them. But I also love to take this as a time to just have interaction with adults because I spend a lot of my time with students who are visually impaired, which is awesome. And I love my students, but I want them to realize that they're going to grow up to be adults who are visually impaired. And what does that look like? And do you ever get to meet an adult who's visually impaired? And what is life like for you? So that's something I really hope that maybe you will get out of today's conversation along that. But since it is White Cane Awareness Panel, we're going to start with all things canes. And we're just going to let each person give us a little brief bit of information about their interaction with white canes. Some of the questions that came in around canes had to do, do you have a working cane and a dress cane? I thought that was a really fun question to think about. Um, or maybe what's the funniest thing that's happened to you while you've used your cane? And Shirley from Kansas City specifically wanted to know, why do you use the cane that you use? So Mr. Christian, we're going to start with you this morning. Tell us about all things canes. What do you think about it? There we go. I'm having trouble with my tech here. I have used a cane for many years since second grade. Miss Judy Ember, who we all, some of us here in Kansas know and love, introduced canes to me. Um, I do not have a special cane for work and a special cane for like just around the town. I do have an old one that's a spare for lake activities that I don't care if it gets lost. And it has a flat metal tip on it that I find is easier to use for off-roading kind of experiences. And my cane I use pretty regularly daily has one of the ball rolling tips. Working at the School for the Blind, I'm lucky that I can go down to our O&M office and um, get help with my cane pretty regularly. So that has helped me transition back into using a cane after I used a dog guide yellow lab for many years. Okay, very good. I love that you tossed in there about tips. That was a question that didn't come up, but that could be a whole conversation for a whole nother day, right? About yes, it could. Absolutely. So Sheila, what do you have to add to that? Well, I am primarily a guide dog user, but I would not be without a cane. I carry with me constantly a teeny tiny little ID cane that's about waist high that I can fold up and stick, you know, in a, in a waist pack when I'm running or um, it's always in my purse in case something were to happen to my guide dog or there's something in the environment that I want to explore and I don't want to ask the guide dog to, to take me through if it's, if it's not appropriate. And I have a regular good Sheila length cane hanging on the back of my office door. And when I'm at work, I don't like order my guide dog to take me to the restroom or take me over to the coffee, coffee, coffee machine or any of those little things. Just like at home, I, you know, of course, walk around with nothing. The office is large enough and with people to run into, you won't see me walk, you know, outside my office without my uh, cane in my hand. And then when I go do sporting events, like I, I'm real big on cross-country skiing, um, you know, you can't take the dogs out on the trail. So very often, there might be like a half mile between my hotel room and through a big, huge hotel and across a parking lot to a bus that I'm going to get on to go out skiing for the day. So I, of course, always have a cane for um, outdoor events where maybe my guide dog can't do his job. So it's, it's like a, a big tool there in my mobility toolbox, my white cane. 
Very good. And I noticed that you mentioned your she good Sheila length cane. So I want to know what is your preferred Sheila length cane? Oh, you would ask me that. I, um, I am not a cane expert, <laughs> um, but I, I know that the waist length one I can get by with if I have to. And sure. the other one is, oh, probably up to my chin or so. I am not, you know, a super particular and my cane lasts me a long time because it doesn't get the hardcore use sure. that Christian's probably does. But I like a long one. I like a lightweight one. I like one that slides easily on the ground. Um, I, I like to walk fast and I feel safer. Um, oh my God, I'm not going to get the technical word right, but uh, is sliding it, swishing it from side to side, the arcing technique, rather than just tapping it, because I can swish faster than I can yeah. pick it up and tap. I was in the 5K run the other day. Um, and I was excited. I don't know if you O and M people would approve, but there were a couple of people running in that race with white canes, and I got a real kick out of that. <laughs> awesome! I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you were able to join that. So, all right, Kelly, you get to follow up now. Tell us about your experience with canes and what you love, or maybe even a funny story. Well, compared to these other two guys, I am a new cane user. Um, I was very resistant to using a cane for 38 years. I guess that ages me here. Uh, I've been a cane user for a little over two years. And I was really resistant because I just didn't think that I needed it. Um, my vision loss has progressed uh, over the last 41 years. And I just never thought that I would benefit from it until all of a sudden it was like, I can't see where I'm going anymore. So um, I really enjoy my cane. It gives me a lot of confidence. I don't, uh, I used to panic just going into a big concert event, just having to walk downstairs, even being able to hang on to my husband. And uh, my favorite cane story is walking into a Celine Dion concert at the Sprint Center in Kansas City and going down all those stairs and letting go of my husband and just having the confidence to make it down those stairs with my cane. Um, and it just made me feel great. Also, it was that was my first experience using my cane in public, um, kind of independently after my instruction. And I loved the fact that when we went to leave and it was a big crowd of people, it was just like a parting of the seas. <laughs> so you see somebody with a cane and they're like, oh, I'm gonna move. Uh, my cane's name is Celine, by the way, after that concert that we went to. Um, I use an Ambutech, I believe it's a graphite cane. It's pretty lightweight. Um, I use a roller, a marshmallow, marshmallow roller tip. And another funny thing about my cane, people always ask me about the color. Well, why are parts of it pink? What does that mean? And I simply say it's because I like pink. <laughs> So um, that's about it for me on a cane. I'm a new user and I'm loving it. Awesome. Thank you. And all of this time always brings up more questions. And I can imas imagine most of you are out there just thinking, but why, but why, but why, but what's this? So talk amongst yourselves if you're with a group. Christian's holding up his cane for us. Christian, you want to tell us something about it there? You're muted, I think, Christian. So. I see your folding cane. It's got the red and black. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I just wanted to hold it up since we we're talking about everything canes. And I thought, oh, oh, it's by my feet. Yeah, where it's absolutely. supposed to be. So there we go. Very good. Okay, so that kicks us off. That's why we were here initially, but there's so much more. And we've already heard in relation to all of you that dog guides are a part of your story one way or another. So we're going to jump to Sheila to tell us a little bit about dog guides because she is, I think, the most experienced dog guide user of our group. Um, and a couple questions we had related to that. Kinnick from Mays specifically wanted to know what it was like to switch from a cane to a dog guide. So if you've had that experience and can speak to it, that would be interesting to hear. And then of course, what things should students consider before they apply for a dog guide? So Sheila, we'll let you get started there. Okay. Um... I did not switch from a cane to a dog guide. I started with a guide dog. It was um, 50 years ago this fall and 
really, they just asked me if I could walk in a straight line. I was like Kelly, resistant to using a cane growing up. If I had been introduced to a cane when I was little, I probably would have done it. But when somebody tried to put a cane in my hands when I was 11 or 12 and very worried about being cool and, and you know, in and everything, I ran away and climbed a tree. <laughs> I just ran around um, running into things and being a brave teenager with no mobility device. I went away to guide dog school and it felt like flying you know, to get that harness in my hand. And I uh, went to college at UCLA, which is a huge campus and walked on Sunset Boulevard to, to go to my classes. And, and I just, I just, you know, feel um, I'm a competent cane user and a brave traveler, but I just feel like I can go anywhere in anything with my guide dog. My guide dog can see and I can't. And if I point across a lobby, of a hotel, um, you know, my guide dog will take me to where I hear the people at the desk and just, you know, whiz around the chairs and the ashtrays and stop at the stairs on the way. And I guess in some ways it's a lot of work to have a guide dog because you have to feed it and keep its training up and, and um, always be responsible for it. But my dogs do so much for me that I don't mind not being able to put them away in the corner um, as I do my cane. So for me, that hybrid lifestyle of having a cane when I need it is a wonderful thing. But the dog is like my mobility sports car. And and I've you know, I've I've been president of Guide Dog Users Incorporated. I worked with the Department of Justice on the definition for service animals. And now I'm fighting with the Department of Transportation about the odious forms they are making us fill out to travel with our guide dog because of the damage that has been done by people um, and pets and a lot of emotional support animals misbehaving, uh, kind of making our way uh, harder in the world as people who work with guide dogs. So I, you know, my dog is Paxton. He's a very fluffy, sweet uh, little yellow lab. And he's my sixth guide dog. And I've had five girls and one guy. And all of my guide dogs have come from Guide Dogs for the Blind in California. And um, it, it just works really well for me um, to be partnered with one. But you need to know your mobility uh, before you get a guide dog. It's very important. Um, I know that Guide Dogs for the Blind will ask three questions on their, uh, their application. Tell us three routes you can do independently. And they'll want to know that you have had good mobility training and that you know how to use a white cane and uh, get yourself out of trouble when you're traveling with that cane. Uh, you don't just get a dog and say, let's go to church or let's go to the library. You have to give that dog very clear instructions and know where you're going. And yeah, GPS apps are great. And I'm sure, you know, many of them probably use those with your white cane. Um, and the dog just gets me there safely, stops at curbs, you know, takes me around poles. I don't run into people on the sidewalk. Um, it's, you know, he is, the means of me getting there safely, but I still have to be the brains of how we travel just like everyone does with a white cane and no reputable guide dog school will issue you a guide dog until you have all those white cane Lisa skills Bola down, Hedman. you know, really well. Oh, thank you, Sheila. That was a great way to say that because as you started talking, I could just see all the comms in the room cringing with, oh my gosh, she didn't use a cane before she got a dog. I know, but right. I'm so, and that's a unique story. It's a unique fine, story. You said that very well <laughs> at the end of exactly what really needs to be considered and how that needs to be covered. And I love that you used that you have to be the brains. That's right. Who have worked with me will be, hopefully be able to say that the most important mobility tool that we use is our brain, right? Regardless of dog or cane or GPS or anything else. So you hit that exactly where we wanted to hear it. Thank you very much. So Christian, you've had lots of experience with dog guides as well. Yes. How would you, what would you like to add? I agree with everything Sheila has stated. I am definitely not as experienced 
um, as Sheila. I have had one dog guide, Broadway, who some know that is now a retired spoiled yellow lab that still lives with me. Um, it is a very different way of traveling because you're not hitting every object as you travel like you are with the cane. And you know, you're hit, hit the trash can and then you know to go around it and you know it's there. The dog is just gonna take you around it with you not even thinking about it, even though you have the brain skills to know where you're going and take all the turns. So it's just very different. And the cane is definitely an important tool to start with, but I agree, I love working with a dog and the dog taking some of that guesswork out of your travel because they're finding the curb for you. Of course, they can get distracted and totally off your line of travel because they are still dogs if they see another dog or a person inappropriately interacts with them. So I think at some point I will choose to get another dog. I am just not ready yet. And I have enjoyed brushing up my cane skills and beating my cane up a little bit to know that I have those skills in my pocket for if I choose not to use a dog that day. Okay, very nice. I like hearing that there are pros and cons. There are, because not as Sheila said, said, everybody should have one. Yeah, as Sheila said, you do have to feed it and water it and find a spot to relieve it. There's a lot that goes yeah. into planning your day to working with a dog that people probably don't think about. And really a very small percentage of the population, if it's all right, if I jump in again, yeah, have sure. guide dogs. Yes. And there are some good reasons and not good reasons about that, but um, you, and some people are really better at using a guide dog, just like some people are better at using a cane than others. You can work and work on your skills and we're, we all have different talents. And, you know, and, and I, I will say that, you know, I, I took to a guide dog, like a, a fish to water. And there are some people who will, um, you know, want a guide dog who sadly, it won't be um, a good idea for them. They, they may be well matched with a dog, they may get a, a bad match, or they may just get a dog and, and it, it doesn't work for them. And they, they may have to, um, you know, rescind that decision and, and go back to the drawing board. So it isn't for everybody. But I, I know people who have, you know, made that switch even later in life and said, why did I wait so long? So it's something, yeah. and, and there are schools, a couple of the schools, Leader Dogs for the Blind in Rochester and Guide Dogs for the Blind in um, San Francisco, both offer opportunities to, um, uh, to experience a dog before getting one or to, brush up on your Correct. mobility training in a, in a live-in situation, like a week-long course where you really work on things. And then the school will help evaluate you at that time. And there are some people who want dogs who don't have strong enough O&M skills. And these programs are also an opportunity for them to really take a crash course and interact with the school personnel to, um, figure out if a dog may or may not be a good fit for you. So there's kind of a way to get your feet wet and not really quite have to commit to getting a dog, you know, okay. at that point. Very good. Yeah, this so is Christian. I'd like to add to that, that those crash, I call it a crash course, but it is definitely a good way to see if you like it. I went to leader dogs. A lot of students have participated in that. And I also wanted the audience to know that when we're referring to a match, after you do all the boring paperwork kind of stuff, you usually send in a video. A lot of times your certified O&M specialist is in on that process of you traveling so they can see how fast you're traveling, what kind of an intersection you're crossing, all those kind of skills. And they use that information to match you with the right dog. And sometimes, that's, you know, a good match with that dog because you have the same temperament, the same walking speed. And there are times that it isn't a good match, but that's kind of the process. And once the guide dog, dog guide, excuse me, is issued to you, then you do either a two week or month long training to learn how to use that tool of a dog while the dog is already trained. I just okay. wanted to clarify that for those who Very don't good. know. 
That's great information because I think that's a question we often get if I'm out with a student. Well, when are they going to get a dog? Well, it's not just a guaranteed automatic everybody's going to get a dog. There's yep. definitely a process there. So it's really nice to hear. And the waiting oh, lists are quite long these days. Yes, so you, you have plenty of time. Lists for lots of things are long these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Kelly, I don't want to cut you off on that subject, but I'm wondering if we can jump into the next one. And if you have something you want to add about that, I, it might even connect in sure. the next topic. Okay. So, because we could talk dog guides all day, right? But we really yes. want to make this a survey and hit lots of different things and get a real feel for life. Um, so we're going to start with Kelly in the next area surrounding career and we had some specific questions come in for Kelly about her career and how she chose it and why she chose it and how she manages it to work and all of those things. So we're just going to give each of you a, just a couple minutes to talk about why you chose your career, what things about it are important to you, why you just all of those different pieces. I'm going to stop asking. I'm going to let Kelly answer. <laughs> So first off on the dog guide subject, I've been waiting for 22 months now for my furry co-captain and oh. companion. So uh, it's been a long wait. It's going to be well worth it. Um, I My application was approved just right before everything started to lock down in 2020. So I know they're having a hard time getting dogs trained with, you know, not being able to take them out in crowds of people and things like that. So I will be patient and wait for my very well-trained dog. <laughs> Uh, as far as my career goes, I actually, um, my vision was good enough in my 20s that I went to radiology school and I did x-rays and CAT scans in a busy hospital for nine years. And all of the sudden that ended uh, with cataracts and some optic nerve damage and I had to change course. Um, luckily, I figured out my plan B when I was 19 years old and I went to massage school because I knew that it was going to come a time when I could not see to do the things that I necessarily set out to do and it was a really great decision because I love what I do I'm I'm a helper I want to help people I require a lot of help myself who doesn't um, but I do love to help people and with the business that I'm in with the industry that I'm in that is what we do um, I chose the school that I went to based on uh, my learning style. I do enjoy being around people and being in a classroom setting, but um, and about an hour away from me in Wichita, Kansas, there was a 70-year-old woman by the name of Mildred who was accredited by the American Massage Therapy Association to teach massage, and she had about 50 years experience doing so, and she did individual classes. So over uh, 10 months time, I did my 550 hours of hands-on training, um, anatomy and physiology, ethics, all of those things. Um, I feel like I benefited from that. Other choices would be, I think Newman University offers classes. Um, I think there's still the Oriental School of Massage. Um, there's great options if massage is the route that you want to go. And, and yes, I mean, it's you, I have had to figure out a way in a lot of cases to accommodate my disability. Um, but it's my business. I run it the way that I want to. And people don't even know sometimes <laughs> I have to tell them, hey, just so you know, I'm, I'm legally blind. I'm losing my eyesight. This is how much I can see. And the main reason I tell people is because if they see me out at the grocery store or something and wave, I'm not going to acknowledge them. And um, anyway, disclosing that I feel is, is part of building the relationships that I have with my clients. Um, I don't know, Anna, what else do you wanna know specifically? Well, the other questions that came in had to do with technology you use every day and where you live. And I happen to know in your case that where you live and where you work, you have a very specific reason for that. So you might want to talk just a bit about those types so of things. So technology wise, iPhone, iPhone, iPhone. I use it to schedule clients. I use it to take payments. I use it to communicate with my clients. I use it uh, even to further my education in my field. Um, I work at home, which is fantastic. 
not for everybody. I am kind of a homebody. Unless I don't feel like being at home, then I'm out. See ya. <laughs> but uh, I love working at home because it provides the independence to work when I want. I don't have to rely on somebody to give me a ride to wherever my work is. There is no, there is public transportation here in Hutchinson, Kansas, but it's not convenient. Um, and it's not very user friendly. The times are weird. Anyway, that's a whole nother subject. Um, but I, I live in a house on a street in the middle of town. I am about five blocks from our pharmacy. I'm five blocks from a grocery store. I'm close to the college, which is a great place to go and walk. Um, I'm in a great location for my clients, which is very important, so. Okay, very good, thank you. So Sheila, then if we jump to you, we you have lots of big titles in your in your description as well, but one of those that jumped out was ADA coordinator. So oh. maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that and then also follow up with where do you live in relationship with where do you work and how does that work out for you? Well, I was, I was a music major in, college and worked as a musician and then when I got married and moved here in middle age um, my my music career I, I sort of just started gradually moving more and more into the advocacy field and I don't it would be interesting to know how much I would have done that if I weren't blind and my whole life wasn't about constantly having to advocate so uh, I as part of when I, when I moved here, I, I did talk my way into a job as public policy coordinator here at The Whole Person, where I still work and have almost been for 12 years. And um, as just, I wanted to, um, I just found the ADA very interesting. And I learned that there was a program taught through you know, the University of Missouri and partly sponsored by um, the ADA, local ADA center. And um, so I was able to take classes uh, by attending, um, this was before there were a ton of podcasts, but there's a lot of online courses to do what I did now, but I did most of mine by um, getting work to send me to the big expensive ADA conferences that used to be held annually in the before times and you know then you take a test and you get certified and I spent some energy looking for work because every entity that has over 50 employees is supposed to have in somebody who makes things ADA compliant but I have not ended up leaving where I am to do that but um that that was how that came about just trying to broaden my scope as an advocate and giving me some credibility. And where I live, I, I live in a house on a bus line along the trolley trail. And like Kelly, it's, it's very important for me to live near things that I need to do daily. And being near a bus that runs as well as any bus can run in Kansas City. And our, we're pretty pathetic in both Missouri and Kansas in terms of public transportation, nothing to brag about. Um, but I did the best I could, ended up paying for a home that is more than I should be paying for, but surely would be making up that money and taking Ubers. And I advise people a lot who, who call the whole person where I work and ask, I'm a person with a disability, where should I live? And I really advise them that when you move, you should really think about your transportation, think about you know, what facilities are near you, because I also then six or seven minute, months later get calls from people who have ignored my sage advice and live in places where they're just waiting for paratransit. I haven't taken a, a real paratransit ride in seven or eight years. I do not have the patience. I, I lose every ounce of maturity and patience I've developed through my lifetime. I cannot do it. I cannot wait for somebody who makes me wait an hour or two hours. So if I can't walk, or I can't take a bus, or I can't afford the Uber, or get a ride with somebody who cares about me. I um, and I have a blind husband, so I don't get a ride from my husband. Um, I I just won't do it. And, but that that's a big, huge, important streak in my independent nature. And not everyone feels that strongly, but that's me. Okay, 
Very good. Thank you. I learned something new in there about the yeah. ADA. And I do want to make clear if someone's not clear, we're saying ADA for American Disabilities Act. Um, and that's making sure that wherever we go in public is accessible to anyone with a disability. And so hearing that, that every place that has 50 plus employees is supposed to have someone overseeing that. I would be curious to talk to people who live in a or work in a facility with 50 plus employees and find out if they know who their ADA coordinator is. And hardly anybody does, but there are no teeth in the law. Sure. And uh, Kansas City hasn't had one now for, oh, a good long while. <laughs> uh, they had, and that's kind of something that trying to remedy here. Okay, very good. Those are good things to hear and learn about. So Christian, I'm gonna do the same with you that I did with Kelly on the last jump. Okay. Kind of add in whatever you have about career and technology. The specific question that came for you related to career had to do with what's your favorite part about coaching forensics, which is one of your duties at KSSB. But then I know this public transportation piece that we're talking about is where we're headed. And such a huge piece of being able to have a job is being able to get yes. you from your job and get what you need. So can you move us from what you do for a job and why and what you love about it into public transportation and how that impacts you. Okay, so as Anna um, stated up front, I am a new teacher of the visually impaired. I was trained through Missouri State University. Some may say go bears um, in, in Springfield. I elected to take all online classes for a master's degree. I use technology daily and that did not really worry me taking a whole online program, entirely online. So I may not be comfortable with that. I enjoyed having the work for the week, you know, class-wise and doing it on my time. I also hold a bachelor's degree from Mid-America Nazarene University near Olathe, Kansas um, in elementary education. So that was an interesting switch for me going from being trained as an elementary educator to working with our K-12 students as a TBI. So the technology, I have so many devices surrounding me, it's not even funny. I have a braille display connected to my computer all day long. I have a braille note touch. I have an iPhone in my pocket. I maybe am too techie, some would say. And I enjoy teaching technology classes at the Kansas School for the Blind because I get to explore many, many new devices and what works and what doesn't work with them. So forensics is another name for public speaking. And I do enjoy coaching the school's team. It allows kids to grow in their skills speaking in public, speaking just in class, and even the reading and writing skills because they may write their own speech. Um, we haven't gotten to travel with all our North Central schools in a while due to the pandemic, but it's always a fun opportunity to take a group of kids to another school for the blind and make connections that way and really watch them be proud of what they learned, whether it's a four minute speech or eight minute speech or a speech that they come up with on the spot called impromptu. The hardest event in my opinion, you get five minutes to come up with a speech off of three topics that are on index cards and no reading or writing is allowed in that event. So it's just very fun to see kids grow in their abilities while also having fun. I think that's all I wanted to share about that. So I'm gonna to attempt to move us into transportation. I live with my parents still in Overland Park, Kansas, a very big suburb, about 30, 35 minutes from the school. I either rely on family members or primarily Uber and Lyft for transportation. The bus route it would take for that is not as convenient as Sheila's. It would be going all the way downtown, probably over an hour, and then transferring and coming back to Kansas City, Kansas. I have investigated it would just be a nightmare that I do not choose to do. If you know my mom is not able to bring me to work, I would gladly use rideshare than deal with all that and waking up that early to deal with those many transfers. Could I do it? Yes. Because I have done bus routes and public transportation here near the school, but that's just something I don't choose to do daily. I really find that in Kansas City, 
Uber and Lyft are pretty similar in their availability. A lot of times I have both apps open and I'm price shopping to see which one is going to be cheaper for where I have to go. I do find that Lyft drivers sometimes are more helpful, like standing there and um, giving me verbal directions to a door of an unfamiliar business or walking with me when I'm not confident. So sometimes I feel that they're just more helpful and there are tracking features, not tracking, excuse me, sharing your location features. That's if someone you care about wants to see when you got picked up or when you got dropped off, you can do that. And they're easier to use on the Lyft platform than on the Uber platform, you know, for security and safety. Lyft does have a longer wait time. I believe it's five minutes from when they arrive to pick you up. So that may give you more time to find your driver than on the Uber platform. Anything else you wanted to know? Yeah, go ahead. No, is there anything else we wanted to know about rideshare, Anna? Blanking. No, I think that's a great start to that conversation. And that's an interesting piece to hear because out here in central Kansas, yes, I think we do have some Uber drivers, not to the extent of what yeah. you have in Kansas City, of course. And so knowing that right, that wait time of how long they will wait from once they arrive until you get to the car, that's important to know. Yeah. That can be a big deal. Two minutes and five minutes is a significant difference in time. <laughs> Well, and you also have to think about when are you going to disclose to the driver that you are someone with a visual impairment standing there with a cane or a dog guide. And there are a, multiple guide dog, guide dog denials around the country where they you know, refu refuse to take you or drive off because you have a dog guide. I have experienced that two or three times in my 10 years of using a dog guide before he retired. So just, you know, when you accept, they accept you as a writer, do you tell them right off the mat, I'm visually impaired, I have a dog guide, or I will have my white cane, or do you wait till they get there? Do you wait till they call you? You know, how do you want to do that? Because I'm not going to see their car, even if I know it's a red Chevy. Sure. And do you have I'm, a preference on that? Um, I've done it both ways. Since our, if I'm on our campus, I usually tell them what, before they arrive, because it likes to take them to the back of our campus on Washington Street for whatever reason, no matter where I am requesting it from. So that, you know, where there's multiple buildings, it can get kind of tricky them finding you based off the GPS spot they're given. So right. I kind of find sometimes it helps to just be upfront that, hey, I'm visually impaired. I won't see you. I'm standing here with my cane. But each people have, every person has a personal preference for that. Absolutely. Good perspective to hear. So um, Sheila and Kelly, you both touched on public transportation a little bit. I do want to make a couple of notes of things that have been happening as we're talking. Sheila, I saw you lift your Braille display while Christian was talking about technology that you have a Braille note touch or something similar right there in your hands. I, I'm a big Braille person. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good to hear. Um, and we did have a question come in, Sheila. Somebody wants to know, what tip do you have on your ID cane? I don't know. <laughs> Fair answer. <laughs> I don't it's know. I, don't know. Um, I, I think it 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 feels kind of silky and plasticky, and it it's shaped like uh, kind of almost like the chapstick that comes up out of the tube it, okay. this particular cane i've had a roller one i liked it it broke the last time i ordered a cane from ambutech i didn't quite know what i was ordering and i ordered one that was too short and gave it away and the and now this one i have is somebody i know who fixes canes gave it to me it's super lightweight and it just has this um silky tip that slides pretty easily okay. i don't know if that might be called a pencil tip i'm not right. sure um without seeing it sounds like a pencil tip so that's but it's awesome. not because it's it just it's working okay but i don't know enough to have made you know an adult choice um i i hope i'm not an embarrassment on this call no, this, that's okay. this is who i am it's um okay to admit that we don't know I and i will i'll that. tell you, you i don't like it when it makes noise so i like it on the carpet sure. but when i go like into the restroom, I kind of pick it up and I air swipe it an inch above the ground because I don't like the way it goes. <laughs> Fair enough. 
We don't always want to be known where we're at. No. <laughs> sure. And one other correction I need to make. Michael Byington was listening carefully and let me know. I said 50 employees. It's 15 employees. There needs to be an identified ADA coordinator no. or representative. Is that correct? No, no. 50 for a, a large entities over. If you have over 15 he's talking about the size of the organization right. yeah and so if it's if it's um but no if you have 15 i don't think it's that i think it's yeah okay. i will we'll double that check that and get that figured out but uh, just know that. that hardly anyone has one who's sure. supposed to yeah good to know okay well we are at the point we need to kind of start thinking about wrapping up so we want to know advice that you each might have, both for O&M instructors, because many of our people joining us and listening today are teaching O&M on the daily. And so we want to know from you as adults, what do you think is important for us to teach? Um, but then also for our student listeners, what piece of advice do you have or would you give? And so let's, Kelly, we haven't heard from you for a while. So I'm going to jump things around. Let's hear from Kelly. What? Additional things you have to say and what advice do you have both for instructors and students? So my advice for instructors, um, of course, I, I didn't have O&M instruction when I was school age. I waited until I was an adult, which is a mistake. Uh, if I had done it sooner, I would be way less direction or directionally challenged. Um, but I guess my advice for O&M instruct instructors would be for all teachers in all school settings. Um, young people need to learn about the disability rights movement. Uh, what the people before us went through to get us the rights that we have now. And I think in, in teaching those things, uh, everyone can learn how to advocate for themselves and for our community, which is, I mean, we have to do it every day. It's just part of life. And I, I think that if I had learned those things when I was younger, and I, it's been a long time since I've been in school, so maybe they do teach it now, but I think that the more that we know of the progress that's been made, the, the better and better things can get for us as we go forward. Um, I hope that makes sense. And what was the other part of it? Oh, advice for students. Yes. Um, having my own business has been the most empowering thing for me just it's been amazing. And I just want people to realize if, if you want to do it, you can immerse yourself in um, learning about finance, especially personal finance, because that can help you with both your own life and your business life. Um, depending on what industry you want to be in, spend time with people who own their own business. You know, if you want to do a massage, but you don't know, or if you want to do massage, but you don't know massage therapist, spend time with a cosmetologist, ask them how they run their business, ask for tips, um, talk to a, an accountant who's self-employed, find out, you know, what they would expect of someone to know about finances for their business. And most of all, if you're going to be if you're going to own your own business and run your own business, the most important asset that you're going to have is the relationships that you build. You can provide a great service or a great product, but if you can't interact with people, be friendly, be able to communicate, show empathy, um, if you can't build those relationships, you're, you're not going to do well. So that's my advice. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Sheila. We do have to, um, we're going to have to go to lunch soon, so we'll have to yes, keep it somewhat brief. Very but. quick. Um, everybody has a different uh, personality and a different comfort zone, but my advice to both teachers and students um, is to toss low expectations out the window. I think a lot of people think they can't do as much as they can. And a lot of people who are the helpers, the teachers also have maybe lower expectations than they, than they need to. Uh, I had a girlfriend in college who went on to become an O&M instructor at San Francisco State. And she always told me, she goes, you know, living with me uh, as a roommate in college, you know, taught her to really, you know, aim high you know, shoot for the stars with her students. And she had a great career and, and, and I just 
wish everyone to, to please know that you are capable. You can go, you can do, and you don't have to sit around and wait for um, others to help you. Or even, you know, don't, if they have low expectations, don't fall for it. Oh, that's a nice phrase. I'm going to keep that one on my wall. They have, they have low expectations. Don't fall for it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Christian, you are now the advice giver. And I do have one question that just popped in that I would love for you to answer. Okay. Um, we have some people joining from a public library and they would love to know, is there a specific keyboard that they should have for their computers for people who are blind? So can you pop that answer in, in the midst of giving us some good advice for life? Boy, that is a tricky question because all our students are so individual. I really put an emphasis on the normal um, keyboard, computer keyboard that has the home row with ASDF, JKL, and semicolon, which is called the QWERTY keyboard, by the way. Most people don't know that. So there's your fact for the day. Having braille displays in available would be awesome that can connect two devices. I have the Focus 40 in my hand that has been next to the computer this whole conversation. Um, so just any type of really just any easy software to access stuff. So I always think it's nice if stuff can libraries and places can be designed with universal access as much as possible, which does get tricky when you have people at differing levels. But what but I heard that's you say a great there answer. The was most of our students hopefully do learn to use a QWERTY keyboard. So if there's a QWERTY yes. keyboard available, that is the beginning. Yes. And then if it can have simple software like the non-visual desktop access screen reader, that will go a long way for students who need um, accessible computers. Great point. Perfect. Okay. So what um, advice do you have for O&M instructors and also for students? I would say that my advice is getting the tools in the student's hands as early as possible. I lost vision later in life, a great degree. I, you know, I had a cane in my hand in second grade, but I had to learn Braille later. I just think giving, getting a cane in kids' hands, getting them used to using it, and getting them started on Braille, if that's appropriate, is probably the best road to take a student down. So when they need to use it for college or later, they have those skills. And then I, I love Sheila's quote about advice for our students. And I'd also like to leave you with, don't be afraid to use your skills. There's nothing wrong with using a white cane. It's going to prove that I can. I can cross the street. I can, you know, find a door. It's your tool. It doesn't mean anything less about you. And just embrace the skills that you have that give you that even playing field with students who do not have a disability. Excellent advice. Thank you each very much, Christian, Sheila, and Kelly. It's been great to have you here today. Those of you who've been listening in, I hope this has been helpful. If you would like to turn your cameras back on, and I'm going to even risk it, I want to say if you want to unmute, and we can all say bye together so we can get a little bit of a feel for who all was here today, feel free to jump in. Again, I hope this was helpful, and we'll see you all again soon. Everybody said. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hold it down. Thank you. Wave, guys. Everybody wave. wave, wave. <laughs> Yay, yeah. transition. Everyone's waving in the thing. <laughs> the logo for the Kansas State School for the Blind. Fade to Black.